to be here with such a group, an esteemed group of scholars and pastors and servants of the Lord and mission workers. Thank you for the privilege of being able to come and share. Um, it is a uh, honor to be able to talk about this topic because it's a significant topic. And if you have not heard much about diaspora missiology uh, in your institutions, I promise you that in the days and years ahead, you most certainly will. And so um, it's, uh, it's interesting to be a part of a movement that is happening around the world and that is having and will have a profound impact upon missiology in the days yet to come. I wanted to share a scripture with you. They are controlling the slides, so we'll just kind of walk through this passage of scripture found in John chapter 4, verse 35, that says, Do you not say there are yet four months, and then comes a harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. One of the things that I find myself encouraging the Christian community globally to do these days is it is time to lift our eyes. If we're not careful, we become nearsighted. We see the fields that are close to us. We see the fields that are around our theological institutions. If you're a pastor, by default and rightfully so, you see the fields that are outside the doors of your church. And in the history of missions, we have always taught our people to look far and see the distant fields and to be able to see the unreached people groups in those unreached places, what we have always called pioneer missions, where we sent people to these non-church, non-Christianized regions to the places where there is no expression of the gospel. There are no churches, there are no Bibles in their language, and there, there's no one to share the gospel. And so for the last 150 years, particularly in modern missions, we have sent people in those directions, and rightfully so, okay? But what do you do when you live in a world where over 50% of the population is mobile. What do you do when a large portion of your world no longer lives in those rural, unreached places? They now live in our urban spaces that are no longer homogeneous, where no longer can you just pick a people group and say, I'm going to work with that people group, where no longer are they monolingual, and where no longer the church is non-existent. What do you do when the world is moving into places where the church already exists? How do you minister to people in these contexts? And those are the kinds of questions that are being raised, risen in diaspora missiology. And so today, my goal is just to perhaps help you as an esteemed body to lift your eyes a little bit from the context in which you have so diligently worked and to see things in a new light. And one of the ways we'll do that is talk about Africa. And Africa is indeed on the move. It's an incredible story to look at the history of Africa and Christianity in Africa and to see what the Lord is doing and how the people of Africa are moving. You know, Africa is a continent. It's not a country. We have to explain that to people back in the United States. Uh, it's a continent. It has 30 million square kilometers. It has some 54 individual unique countries. And as of today, it has right at 1.3 billion people. It's not a small place, is it? We, in this room, you represent a vast diversity of people. And the thing you need to understand when we talk about statistics, that which I'll share today may be true, but it's probably not accurate, okay? No one knows the numbers. Anytime someone quotes you statistics about migration, diaspora, those sorts of things, they're just quoting official numbers that came off of a government record that may or may not have been accurate and most often was missing huge segments of their communities. But if we go off the official records, it will say that one in five Africans is on the move, somewhere in the neighborhood of 233 million. Personally, I think we could inverse that and we could probably say four out of every five Africans is on the move. 
I think we could easily say half of the people that you meet are not living, working, serving in the same community in which they were born and raised. People are on the move. They are going from point A to point B to point C. And so Africa is highly migratory, both internal to the continent and off of the continent. And so one of the things that diaspora missiology is talking about is migration. And generally, when we talk about migration, particularly in missional context, what you will hear most are about efforts to reach those who are refugees, or those who are internally displaced, or those who are involuntarily displaced, those who have great needs. And I would say today, we cannot ignore them, but if we believe the numbers, they only represent about 20% of all the people on the move. What that means is 80% of the people, four out of every five migrants that you meet, they're on the move, but they're on the move legally. That means they went from point A to point B with a bus ticket, they flew from one city to another city, they crossed an international border, they had a visa in their hand, they had a reason to go where they were going, they were oftentimes invited to go where they were going, they were received well when they arrived there, they have everything that they need to survive there, and actually their migration has been very profitable for them and for their families back home. And so if we're not careful, we define movements as very small movements rather than the large movements that are quite honestly natural and normal. In fact, I would argue everyone in this room is a migrant by that definition. And you moved from where you were to where you are because you were invited or you took an opportunity. It was in the will of the Lord. You did so legally, and it has been good for you. It has been good for your family. And so we need to understand when we're talking about migration that we're talking about those, the entire group, not just one segment. There are 27 million Africans who have moved off the continent of Africa. Uh, and what that means is, and actually about 1.8 million a year, which means about 35 Africans every 10 minutes leaves the African continent to go somewhere. And once again, the vast majority of them are leaving on an airplane, they bought a ticket, they have a visa, and they've been invited to go where they're going. Now, we do have those percentages that are moving illegally, and it's a tragic situation. I spend an awful lot of my time with that, but we need to keep this into perspective and see the larger picture of what's going on. We're gonna to talk today about incentives. Why do people move? A little bit about African incentives for international migration. We're continuing narrowing this down. My goal is to give you just a picture. And so there are incentives for Africans to move. We're also going to talk about international incentives for African migration, whereby other countries are inviting Africans to come. It's not just the Africans who desire to move. There are huge interests external to Africa that desire for Africans to move. And we'll, so we'll touch about that a little bit. There's two primary ways that it's happening, uh, one of which is economic. And so if we can switch to that, the primary reason why people move in Africa is economic movements. Um, and quite honestly, on the African continent, it is poverty that drives that. We need to understand 60% of African populations live, particularly in urban contexts, live in slum conditions. That means they are extremely poor. Nine out of 10 of every African on the continent, nine out of 10 are living on less than $5.50 a day. That means 90% of the African population is not wealthy. Now, in many places, $5.50 in US dollars has a lot of purchasing power. Well, let's understand they're not wealthy. We need to understand that of those 10, and out of those nine out of 10, four are living on less than $2 a day, and many are living on much less than that. Currently, Africa has a working population of over 650 million people, but a third of them are out of work and are searching for work. 
Uh, and those numbers are expected to double in the next 15 years. And so you have, a, you have a continent of people who do not have excessive resource and many of whom are searching for work. And so when you're hungry and you're searching for work, what do you do? You go where you perceive there is work to be found. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's no judgment in that. Um, the key to us to understand, though, is that it's real hard for poor people to migrate. Especially when we're talking about international migration or, or migration from one country to another. The poorest of the poor don't migrate. We talk about refugees. You understand, the poorest of the refugees don't go anywhere. There's the one, they're the ones who stay at home and suffer because it takes money to move. It takes resource to move. And so when we're looking at diaspora populations, we're probably not talking about the poorest of the poor in Africa. We're talking about those who had access, who had resource, who had networks to go from point A to point B. Particularly the 80% who are moving legally, they had significant resource. In fact, the vast majority of the 80% who are migrating are in the category of the one out of 10 who makes more than $5.50 a day. And so the African diaspora, by and part, is not a poverty stricken group. There's also a history to migration. You understand that I work a lot with Sub-Saharan Africans out of West Africa. And from the colonial days, there were strong connections between Europe and the African continent. And what that means is after World War II, when there were great needs for reconstruction, do you know who rebuilt Europe? It was the African labor force. And so European countries created pathways for Africans to migrate to Europe, to have jobs in Europe, so that they could assist with the rebuilding processes. And so the roads were rebuilt, the buildings were rebuilt, the factories were staffed, oftentimes by African immigrants who had arrived in those countries by the invitation of the countries legally. They had jobs, they settled down, and in the midst of their settling, they made a life in Europe. And so you you can speak to many African families who can tell you stories. You can go into many African communities who can tell you stories of how members in their community now live in Europe. Or as you're driving through the communities and you see the houses that have been built and the families who have resource and you ask them where did those resources come from, they will tell you that those resources came from their family members who migrated to Europe and was able to earn those resources. And many of those family members are still there, and so those community connections abide, and it's through those networks that many people discover that they can then follow. It's through those invitations from family members and government policies that allow that. So we have this long history of migration, and that history is in part what is sustaining many African communities. Today, some 400 and, or $48 billion a year comes back to Africa simply in remittances. I read a report just this week that globally, one out of eight people in the world, a billion people in the world are sustained by remittances. They're directly involved. 200 million people in the world are sending the remittances. 800 million people in the world are surviving on those remittances. I would argue across much of Africa, those numbers are quite similar. We have many communities that are dependent and many government structures that are dependent upon those remittances. Today, there's 1.6 million Africans in Europe. And those are the ones that are there legally. Those are the ones that the government can count. I would argue you could probably double that number if we were counting all of those who um, have not been counted or are there illegally. And what that means is you've got over 20 million folks just in Europe alone who are sending resources back to their families and to their communities. You combine that with the poverty and it, is, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that there's a huge incentive to go to Europe to make money to send back to your family. There's another incentive, and it's education. 
Educational situations in Africa have changed dramatically across the years. There was a time 20, 30 years ago when they were, uh, the, the enrollment rate in primary school was very low. It may have been 40%, 50%. Uh, most sources will tell you that across Africa today, some 99% of all children are enrolled in primary school. Now, we know that in most communities, enrollment does not mean in attendance, but they're enrolled. But what we do know is of out of primary school, out of all those who are enrolled, about half will finish. Of that half who finish, about a third will go on to secondary school. And of those who go to secondary school, about half of those will finish. And by the year 2030, it is estimated that some 60% of those attending high school will graduate. If those numbers are accurate, that would mean by 2030, there is going to be an estimated 137 million high school graduates between the age of 20 and 24 who are capable and possibly able to go to university. And so Africa is about to experience a huge wave of young adults who could potentially become university students. And here's something that's becoming very well known across Africa. The pathway to escape poverty is through education. And so families are working very hard to make sure at least one of their children can achieve a university education because they believe they're putting their hope in that educational process that that one child will graduate, will get a job, and through that job will be able to sustain their family economically. And so there are huge, huge educational motivations transpiring across Africa. Today, over 400,000 students have left the African continent to pursue international education. Think about that. On your continent, you have 400,000 university students studying somewhere else in the world. And many of them will return They'll be very successful in what they're doing. And in the process, they will encourage others to go. And so there is this wave coming of diaspora on the African continent that will eclipse that which you're seeing today. Not only are there motivations for Africans to move, other countries have high motivations for Africans to come. Uh, I could have cited a number of examples. I want to give you two illustrations uh, today. They're simply examples. We could replicate these in multiple ways, but I wanted to give you an example that would fall in the Anglophone world, and I wanted to give you an illustration that would flow in the Francophone world. If we begin with Turkey, I want you to notice this map. It's very significant that I place there. That is, those are the air routes of Turkish air. That's where Turkish Airlines, the airline of the Turkish government, flies onto the African continent. It is by no accident that those locations are there. The Turkish government very much desires to engage in business with Africa. As you well know, Africa is a very rich continent, and there are a lot of people who would love to get their economic fingers into your business. They want to sell you their goods, and they want you to buy their goods. They want that exchange of economy. This year alone, Turkey has a trade volume of $38 billion, and their desire is to increase that to $50 billion. They invest some $6 billion in direct foreign aid into the African continent, and they currently have over 1,000 ongoing projects to help various communities and countries build roads, build structures. They want to be involved, and that's only going to increase now that Erdogan has been reelected president in Turkey. He has driven this very, very hard. Currently, 
In Ankara, the capital of Turkey, there are 38 African countries that have embassies in Turkey, and Turkey currently has 44 embassies in, embassies in 44 different countries here in Africa. And so they have invested greatly here. Turkey understands that the way to build the bridges with Africa is through her students. And so back in 1992, they began what they called the Great Student Project. At that point in time, Turkey placed over 100 schools on the continent of Africa to train African students, to give students an opportunity for education. In those schools, they teach about Turkish culture. In those schools, you can learn the Turkish language. Today, there's over 175 such schools in 26 African countries, and their number one goal is for the graduates of those schools to go to Turkey, to go to university. And they understand very clearly that if you go to university in Turkey, you're gonna be very happy with your Turkish brethren. And when you come back to Africa, you're gonna be very open to engaging in Turkish business, whether you're in the business community, the political arena, uh, those graduates are gonna come back and build strong relational ties. Currently, Turkey offers over a thousand scholarships a year to African students who can go to Turkey on full ride scholarships to get a university education. Most every university which is scattered across Turkey has created some 50 slots for African students. It's the craziest thing in the world. You can go into a rural community in central Turkey and they'll have a university and you'll find a group of 50 African students there. And as we'll see in a moment, many of them are believers. Why? Because the Turkish government is offering programs in English, training English speakers in Turkish, and much of Anglophone Africa is coming from a Christian context. And so you can go into all of those communities and you'll find African Christians gathering for worship across Turkey. Turkey's highly incentivized to do that. Let me give you another one on the Francophone side, that's Morocco. I live in Morocco, it's a hub from which we travel around the Mediterranean. It's a wonderful country, I would invite you to come. It's very open. Uh, it's not hard to get a tourist uh, visa to come and visit Morocco. Morocco very much desires to have contact with Sub-Saharan Africa. They have um, built a number of projects economically, religiously, and educationally. Uh, when the king of Morocco, the new king, uh, Mohammed VI, assumed the throne, he engaged in what he called the New Africa Project. And once again, one of his primary objectives was to build economic relations with Sub-Saharan Africa, and he knew the way to do that was through students. Today, you can go into Morocco, and Morocco hosts over 20,000 Sub-Saharan African students in their country. 12,000 of them are enrolled in university contexts, and over 10,000 have been given scholarships uh, at some level to be able to attend school there. And so you can go across Morocco and you can find all kinds of Sub-Saharan uh, students. Many of them are Francophone students or coming from Francophone countries because French is the language there. And so they find it very easy to integrate into Moroccan culture. Um, I find it quite amazing, the Christian expression that I find in Morocco that's coming through university students. The Evangelical Church of Morocco uh, is a, um, a church that is led by Sub-Saharan students. They have Sub-Saharan pastors. There's probably 10 or 11 such churches, one in every major city of Morocco, certainly one next to every university that has a lot of Sub-Saharan students. At, on any given Sunday, you can walk into one of those churches and you'll see between 100 and 150 Sub-Saharan students who have gathered to worship, uh, serving the Lord, very actively engaging in their communities, and they are welcomed by the Moroccan government, desired by the Moroccan government, recruited by the Moroccan government, and I'm going to argue before you they are some of the most impressive young adults that I have ever had the privilege to be around. I want us to go to the Great Commission. We know this by heart, amen? We always focus on the Great Commission from the perspective of going. We're supposed to send someone, amen? 
It's a lot of what we've been talking about here today. But I want to encourage you to lift your eyes. And I don't want to take away from this. And whatever you do, do not hear me diminishing the work of Pioneer Missions. Because as we've heard, there are still a lot of places where the gospel has not ever been shared, not ever been heard. And currently today, the church is incredibly well equipped to do Pioneer Missions. All right? But what I want to encourage you today is I want to encourage you to lift your eyes and I want you to see some of these places that are outside of your community. And I want you to realize that there are those who have already gone. They are missionaries. They just don't know it. You sent them. Every time I get next to one of these students, I was in Izmir, Turkey just a few weeks ago at this incredible church uh, of, uh, led by a Nigerian pastor, and probably 60 to 70 percent of their students are either taking their master's degrees or doing their PhD degrees there. These are some of the brightest kids you'll ever bump into. They are the cream of the crop, and they love Jesus with all their heart, and they're asking the question, how do I serve God in this place? Now, if that student were sitting in your church, and I could ask any one of them, tell me about your home church, and they could tell me about their home church. But if that student were from your church, and they were still sitting in your church, they would be the one you're trying to recruit to go to Turkey. They'd be the ones you would be saying, is God calling you to missions? And they're already there, and they have already mastered the language, and they already have a legal reason to be there. They've already been invited. They already have a, a visa, and most of them already have a job and are self-supporting. They don't need a dime from you. All they need you to do is to acknowledge them. All they need is for the, all they need is for their pastor to call them and say, "I know your name." You have been sent from God. How can I support you? How can I encourage you? How can I help you? They're already there. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't recruit and send, but my stars, can we not acknowledge those that God has already recruited, has already sent, and along the journey they have grown to the point of their spiritual lives where they realize that they are called of God. And so I asked the question today, and I think this was the question for our gathering. How do we engage that? Well, step one is you have to lift your eyes and see it. If you cannot see it, you cannot engage it. But if you can lift your eyes and see it, then there's some things that we can do. Number one, we can equip those who are already there. Now, you notice I've narrowed this thing down to students. We could talk about broad categories of folks who are already there. But for today, let's just narrow it down to students. And the question becomes, how could you equip the students who are there? And then the second question is, how are you going to prepare those students who are going to go? Because the 400,000 have already gone, and you're going to have 137 million getting ready to go to university by 2030. I got news for you. There's more who are going to go. And so let's focus on how do we equip those who are there and how do we prepare those who are getting ready to go. And so I would say for those who are there, if you're a pastor, and many of you are, you're serving in the local church, first thing I would do is I would just sit down and make a list of the students who have already gone. Who do you have from your church who has already left Africa and is serving somewhere around the world? I would encourage you to reach out to them. I would encourage you to check on them. I would encourage you to see where they are and what they're doing and how God's working in their lives. I would encourage you to ask them where they're attending church. I would encourage you to find the name of their pastor. I would encourage you to contact that pastor and ask that pastor, how can you help that pastor grow and disciple that student who is in his church? I would encourage you to build a bridge with that church because chances are there's other students in that church. And starting immediately, you can find pathways 
to encourage and to acknowledge the students who are already there doing the work for the kingdom. If you're serving in an educational institution, of which that's the reason why you're here, I would encourage you to develop extension programs where those students who are in other locations can get online and call back home and get the training that they need to do the work that God has called them to do where they are. They may be in some little town in Turkey where the only gathering of Christ is amongst other students. But you know what? They're at a level where they can easily engage in your programming. They're at a level where they can easily be trained by you. It won't take much. It wouldn't take much effort. It wouldn't take much extension in your programming to offer training to them to know how to do the work that God has opened the door for them to do. And so engage those who are there. There's organizations that are in place that can help you do that. And there's three that I want to call attention to. I want to be careful with time, but there's three I want to call your attention to. First off are international student ministries. Most every major denomination and most every major mission organization around the world is doing work among international students. Chances are, wherever your students are, there's an international organization in that region who is working to do exactly what you would wish you could do if you were there. They're engaging students, they're training students, they're discipling students, and they're giving students opportunity to discover how to minister to other students. These international student ministries. Also, in most every place where you will go, there are international churches. These international churches are churches, in the past, they were led mostly from people from the West by mission agencies who would go plant a church in a community. That has evolved much across the years. Uh, today, most countries are inviting international churches to come and be planted in their communities. Morocco is very open to the international church. Why? Because Morocco wants foreigners to come to their country. Morocco wants business with the West. Morocco wants a relationship. Morocco wants to enhance her vision that says there's religious freedom in Morocco. Now understand, Morocco is 99% Muslim. And if you go to Morocco and you try to share the gospel with a Moroccan, you'll get kicked out in a heartbeat. Moroccan does, Morocco does not want you messing with Moroccans. But Morocco does not care if you mess with other internationals. Morocco does not care if you plan a church for other internationals to attend. In fact, that makes them look good on the international front page. And so there's three international churches in Morocco established by the Assembly of God that are doing a tremendous work. And do you know who attends those international churches? Mostly Anglophone Sub-Saharan Africans. Here's a group that gathers in Marrakesh. And, you know, and a lot of them are not there legally. Many of them are there legally. And the Moroccan government is tickled to death for them to be there. Because whenever Morocco has a migrant, particularly an illegal migrant, who's expressing their faith, that means they're probably not doing things they shouldn't be doing. And Morocco sees the international church as an asset. And so there's international churches. There's an estimated over 1,000 international churches established in over 400 global cities around the world, many of them in non-Christian communities. Most of them see themselves as centers, as hubs for missional outreach, and most of them would be tickled to death to have a sub-Saharan student come and work among them, intern with them, and they would help them plan a church in their community, and they would be welcomed by their government. International churches. And then we have another kind of church. If you'd switch the slide. We have immigrant churches. Everywhere you go, immigrants are carrying their faith with them, and when they carry their faith with them, if they don't find a church to attend, they start one themselves and they gather and worship. I'm in Morocco and I was contacted about a month and a half ago and asked if I could assist in locating 
well, if I could actually assist in securing the international church location so that a group of Zambian students could hold a funeral service for one of their members who had just graduated, was about to go back to Zambia, and he went on a, a, a celebration of his graduation and went to Tangier. And you, young man died, he drowned. And they said, Pastor Mitch, can you help us secure a place so that we can have a funeral, a service, where the other Zambian students can come and celebrate his life? Zambian students in Morocco. I found out they gather for worship every Sunday in a little apartment in a Moroccan community. And they express their faith through who they are, where they are. These immigrant churches are all over. My God, who knows how many Nigerian churches are in Morocco. My stars are everywhere. Um, immigrant church, everywhere I go, I find immigrant churches. Most of them are led by people who do not have theological training. They'd love to get it if they could, but they're not. Many of them are led by international students. Some of the strongest immigrant churches you'll find around the world are led by international students with PhD degrees who went to a country, got their degree, was offered a job, and God said, no, you're here to plant a church. I can take you to churches all across Europe that are established that way. And every one of those churches, they're an open door for you to plug your students into and help them to grow to be who God has called them to be. I guess I have to, you know, the danger of asking a pastor to stay to 30 minutes is, <laughs> just doesn't work. Let's talk, about, let's talk about preparing those students who are yet to go. You've got, you've got multiple options. First off, in the African system, uh, once again, realize you've got, by 2030, it's estimated you'll have 137 million students ready for university. Most of them are in your churches today. What would happen if you began to cultivate a missional heart in those students before they ever graduate high school? What would happen if you were to take the best and the brightest that you have and you were to explain to them that there are countries all around the world that if they will excel in high school, they can compete and they can win the scholarships and those countries will give them a full ride scholarship to go around the world and to pursue advanced degrees. What would happen if you began to prepare your students today to be one of those international students tomorrow? And they're going with a heart to be a missionary. God will just use them through their vocation as an engineer or a physician or a teacher. And they will go and, and they have the opportunity to be international missionaries. What would happen if you were to encourage the students in your church or in your community who happen to be one of those 175 communities that has a Turkish school in your community, and you were to encourage your parents to send their kids to one of those Turkish schools. Because here's what I know. That child's going to go to a Turkish school. They're going to learn Turkish culture. They're going to learn Turkish language. And when they graduate, they're guaranteed an invitation to go to Turkey for university. Do you not think there are parents who would be highly incentivized? to allow that to happen. And if they're coming out of a church that is training and preparing their students for that, you are preparing a future missional force. I want you to know it's not just Morocco and it's not just Turkey. There's over 100,000 sub-Saharan students in France. We can just go down the line between the UK and the United States and China. China is, China is closed to Western missionary presence today. But did you know there's over half a million Africans in China today? And China is inviting African students every day and providing scholarships for them to come. Those university students, those future university students are an incredible, incredible source for that. 
African seminaries. That's you. Here you are today. We've already spoken about some of this, but do you realize that these scholarships are open to some of the brightest students who can compete and gain those scholarships, and many of them are getting a seminary degree today. They received a university education. They're now receiving a seminary education, and they could now post-seminary pursue PhD studies in accredited, in accredited universities around the world, and granted it will not be a theological PhD degree, but they've already got their theological training at your school. They're now able to enter into the market, a global marketplace, and have significant influence for the kingdom of God. You have the opportunity to prepare and encourage your students to take those next steps. You have the opportunity to create training programs that would enable the students who are already there to receive the education that they need. All it takes is for you to lift your eyes and to see the possibility. All it takes is a vision for what the Lord is going to do through those who are on the move, and you possess everything that you need. Listen, folks. It was indeed the West that God used in an incredible way to share the gospel around the world. At the Edinburgh Conference in the early 1900s, there were not very many Africans present. In fact, I think there's only one, Samuel Crowther. Today, Africa is the center of Christianity around the world. We may have had our day in the West with pioneer missions, but I want you to know something. Diaspora missions belongs to you. It will not be the West that engages the world through moving people. It will be the global South, and it will be Africa. And if she's going to do that, She's going to do that at your leadership. I encourage you to catch the vision and to lift your eyes and see that the fields are truly white unto harvest. For our discussion time today, I want you to think about some things. I want you to think about how could you and your institution engage students who are already on the field? How can you engage these university students Understand, another point, if you just want to look at institutional sustainment, many of those students are going to come back and many of them are going to be looking for a seminary to go to. Even with their advanced degrees, they've felt the call to missions and they're going to come back. But the question is, how do you engage the students on the field? That's one. Number two, what can you, through your institution, prepare these students, and by that I mean high school students, future students, future university students, what can you do today to prepare them for their future university missional assignments? And then I want you to talk among yourselves of how can you encourage seminary students to engage these existing pathways? Because honestly, you may not be the one who leads in this, but I guarantee you that they will be. And so you're going to have to cast that vision for them, for them to catch it. I want you to take the time that we have remaining and discuss those things. And then we'll come back very, very briefly and talk about some of those things. Uh, so, so just divide up among your groups and let's do that.